So our speaker tonight is Laura Browder, as you know, and she will be talking about communism is 20th century Americanism or the odyssey of Earl Browder. And, uh, and Laura Browder herself, she's, a, she's his granddaughter of Earl Browder, a uh, very interesting family, very interesting part of America's history. She is a Tyler and Alice Haynes Professor of American Studies at the University of Richmond <clears throat> and is the executive producer of the PBS documentary, The Reconstruction of Asa Carter, based on her book, Slippery Characters, Ethnic Impersonators and American Identities. She is currently working on a biography of her grandfather entitled Patriot, The Lives of Earl Browder, her, mo her most recent book, based on the traveling exhibit of the same name, is When Janie Comes Marching Home, Portraits of Women Combat Veterans uh, with photographs by Sacha Flaging, Flaging. Uh, for which she interviewed 52 women from all branches of the military. I mean, v not many people know about the illustrious history, I'm gonna say illustrious history of, of communism in the United States, and I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to discover this very e interesting aspect of modern American history. So please help me welcome Laura Browder to the podium. Thank you so much, Anwar, and thank you all for coming. It is really a, a huge pleasure to be here. Uh, you have such a beautiful campus, and what you're doing here in the Global Humanities Center seems so exciting. Uh, you will have to bear with me because I'm talking about a project that is both very new and very overwhelming in its scope, so I hope I can make all of the pieces cohere. I wanted to start with a photograph of my grandfather, Earl Browder, who, of course, as a small child, I knew only as my grandfather. But by the time I was five and Humphrey and Nixon were running against each other in the 1968 presidential election, and I came home from kindergarten one day to tell my mother who everyone was voting for if they could vote, she said, you know, your grandfather ran for president too. He had run for president twice, in fact, against Roosevelt in 1936 and 1940. And I became very interested in his previous life. And the more I learned, the more fascinating it was. Here he is on the cover of Time Magazine in 1938 as Comrade Earl Browder. Earl Browder was born in Wichita, Kansas in 1891 and grew up in a large, poor family, had to drop out of school when he was nine years old in order to help support the family, and by the time he was 15, was leading a somewhat complicated double life. He had become an accountant, but he was also becoming a socialist, along with his father, two of his brothers, and one of his sisters. And he spent his teenage years and his early 20s working in trade unions, and dabbling somewhat in journalism, but it wasn't until the advent of the First World War and the lead up to America's involvement that he really became a public speaker and he really stepped out. This was a time when many on the left, including trade union leaders, were in favor of America's involvement in the war. My grandfather was not, and he became a draft resistor. And this was right around the time in 1917 when the U.S. Espionage Act was passed, a federal act that was designed to make it much easier for the government to prosecute radicals of all kinds of different persuasions. So my grandfather first spent a year in a Kansas City jail, was out on bail for a while editing a newspaper called The Worker's World, and then went to Leavenworth, federal prison, which had opened very recently, he went along with his brother Bill, and their father proudly published a poem in the workers' world called At the Prison Gate, which was all about how wonderful it was that his sons had taken this step. His time in Leavenworth was extremely formative. It's so hard to imagine now. He was there at a time when a hundred revolutionaries, American and Mexican, were also there. They had a daily study group in the prison yard. He was being sent books from three different libraries, University of Chicago, Penn, the public library in Kansas City, 
A U.S. Senator from Missouri, Jim Reed, had arranged that he wouldn't have to work at a regular job. He could be a, on the music detail. So he just played his flute all the time, learned how to play tennis, and most of all, finally forced himself to read Das Kapital, which he had been trying to get himself to read for years very unsuccessfully, but now he was literally a captive audience. Although he wasn't there to be present when the Communist Party was founded because he was still in prison, by the time he got out, he became very quickly deeply involved. Remember, this is just a few years after the Bolshevik Revolution, and he spent the 1920s traveling back and forth between the United States, Moscow, and Shanghai, where he was instrumental in working in the Chinese trade unions. And by the time 1930 hit, he had become a leader. He was the head of the Communist Party from 1930 to 1945. And he took it in a very different direction. His chief rival in the party, who was the leader before my grandfather and after, William Z. Foster had as his preferred slogan, towards a Soviet America. My grandfather had a very different approach, and his slogan was communism is 20th century Americanism, because his goal was really to mine the American revolutionary tradition and wed it to other more recent traditions. So here he is with his running mate, James Ford, in 1936, and here he is out on the stump. He was constantly surrounded by photographers and journalists, as you can see, wherever he went, and he gave speeches to any number of different groups. He would speak to Unitarians and Catholics, the YWCA, as well as union groups and communists. He was extremely ecumenical, and his point of view was that even if groups didn't necessarily think of themselves as progressive yet, they could be progressive. So there he is giving one of his many speeches. He usually gave about 30 talks a year to public groups, plus any number of extra talks to communist groups. And here is the banner proudly proclaiming for the first time that communism is 20th century Americanism. And you can see there is George Washington right up there with Karl Marx and Frederick Douglass. It's quite an interesting combination. And this was the period in the 1930s when the party really embraced this slogan to the point where my grandfather became the perfect front man with his kind of Anglo-American looks and his Midwestern accent. I interviewed John Stachel, who was the son of party leader Jack Stachel recently, and he told me that in fact his, his own father had come up with this slogan, but because Jack Stachel had a very heavy Lithuanian accent and was clearly an immigrant, he wasn't the right person, the party thought, to be the front man, and my grandfather was. So there you can see on one side, we've got uh, Lincoln, Washington, and Jefferson, and on the other, we've got Marx, Lenin, and Stalin. And my grandfather's great challenge was to meld the two and to create a kind of new American radicalism that would be both deeply patriotic and deeply international. He was on the front lines of most of the, the causes of his day. Here he is with the Scottsboro Boys in the mid-1930s. And here he is with labor leader Ella Mother Bloor, who he had known in the 19-teens in Kansas City and who continued to be an important labor leader. A kind of cult of personality developed around him in the Communist Party. You can see here's a portrait of him with all of the books that he's written. And here's even a song about him called The Quiet Man from Kansas. Uh, parents named their children after him. Here is a baby who is reading one of his books, What is Communism?, and whose proud parents wrote to my grandfather uh, announcing that they wanted to name their son after their favorite American. And incidentally, when I found this picture, I thought how wonderful it would be to look up this baby and see what had become of him but unfortunately, it turns out that this young communist baby grew up to be 
a community college professor who was subsequently arrested for embezzling three million dollars <laughs> from the Veterans Administration by running fake classes for veterans. So the story became a little less inspiring at that point. <laughs> right? <laughs> so everything was going pretty well for my grandfather in most ways up through the Second World War. And then he hit a major bump. Stalin decided, my, my grandfather had felt very emboldened by the positive public reaction to communism as 20th century Americanism. And he had felt that he could take it a step farther. And he began writing about all of the ways in which communism and capitalism could work together and do even more than coexist peacefully. This became too much for Stalin. And immediately after the end of the Second World War, he had my grandfather expelled from the Communist Party. And he went overnight from being the most celebrated left leader in America to being a pariah on the left, which, as you could imagine, was very difficult for the family. It turned out that the party of Lenin and Stalin might not be able to actually embody American patriotism. And this conflict became more poignant still some 22 years after my grandfather's death. He died in 1973. And in 1995, a series of KGB cables were declassified called the Venona Project. And these cables purported that my grandfather and other American communists had been sharing secrets with the Soviet Union. And at this point, of course, uh, those on the more conservative wings of the historical profession who had always seen the American Communist Party as being just a puppet of the Soviet Union were confirmed in their beliefs. As you could also imagine, this was uh, very difficult news for my father and his brothers to wrap their heads around. To them, it was pretty clear that this was just kind of more recycled, anti-communist rhetoric. Who knew what was in those files anyway? But as time has gone on, it's become clear to them that my grandfather was sharing something. So this is where my project really began. As I said, all throughout my life, I'd been very interested in my grandfather, but I knew that it was a very, very touchy subject in my family. My father did not like to talk about his past much. He had had a lot of difficult times because his father was in and out of prison and, of course, was heavily persecuted by McCarthy and his colleagues, as was my grandmother. He didn't like to talk about it much. But on the other hand, I thought this was a really important story and a very complicated story and perhaps the key for understanding something really fundamental about American radicalism. So a couple of years ago, I began to do research. I interviewed my father and his brothers and uh, another son of a Communist Party leader, historians, and I went to archives to the NYU Tamament Library where the Communist Party had sold off all of their archives after the party shut down, essentially in the early aughts, and most important of all, to Syracuse University. Because my grandfather in the mid-1960s had fallen on hard times and had sold all of his materials to a rare book dealer who in turn had sold them to Syracuse. So right now at Syracuse, he's got, in addition to his personal library and everything he ever published, there are 86 boxes of his unpublished materials, which I've been working my way through. And as I worked my way through these materials, I began to see that this wasn't just a story about American communism. This was a very complex family story that spanned the United States and the Soviet Union, that touched on Hitler as well as Stalin, and that continues to reverberate today in an age where this country has gone deeper and deeper into national security, right? And I think Edward Snowden, of course, is the name we all know. But every day, 
in the newspapers, right, we see new articles about the National Security Administration and what it has been up to. So this is a portrait of my grandparents who, to me, embody this very complicated relationship. Um, on the left is my grandmother, Raisa Berkman Browder. My grandfather met her for the first time when he was in the Soviet Union. He went over in 1921 and had a series of trips. Here he is. He's just come off of the Trans-Siberian Railroad and is on his way to Shanghai. When he was in 1925 in a training camp for future communist leaders, he met my grandmother, Raisa, who was herself a Bolshevik. And in short order, they had my uncle Felix, and in 1927, and then my father, Andrew, in 1931, and when she was pregnant with the last brother in 1933, she came to the United States. She was having a very difficult pregnancy, and with them is their nyanya, who was with her and the babies from birth, and who a year later followed the family to the United States. And, you know, I still remember Nyanya from when I was little. She was this tiny little Russian lady with a braid down to her knees who spoke no English and was always smiling. And she stayed with the family until her death in the 1960s. So that was the family. They worked together much for the first seven years because my grandfather worked primarily in New York and Shanghai. So it was quite a commuting relationship. Every so often, he would visit Moscow, they would have another baby, but for the most part, the relationship existed through letters. They started off, uh, you know, when I read those early letters, there is very little of a connection between the two. My grandmother is usually writing to ask him to send cod liver oil or shoes. Could you imagine being through those Moscow winters with no shoes? And, you know, the family was really starving in those days. And to ask him when he was going to write, when he was going to visit. But it was clear that by the time she got here, they really formed a family. And there he is relaxing in the countryside. And there he is playing the flute that he learned to play so well during his time in Leavenworth prison. And, of course, for the most part, there he was out on the road surrounded by American flags. He spent time as well in Spain during the Civil War era. He was there on the front lines to support the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and to provide support for all of the, the troops there. Conditions were very tough so that when he got back, his health was essentially broken. Here's a picture that I love of him and my grandmother on the beach in Florida. Every single other person on the beach, of course, is in a bathing suit, and there they are in their suits. I think it's a wonderful image. And there he is surrounded by happy children. But here he is in a, a less wonderful moment. Although he was very, very active during this time as leader, when the Nazi-Soviet pact hit in 1939, the climate in the United States changed dramatically. Although up until that point, and past that point, I have letters to him from a Supreme Court justice, from congressmen, you know, thank you notes, personal notes. It's hard to imagine now a circumstance in which a Supreme Court justice would be writing a friendly letter to the head of the American Communist Party, but times were different then. By the time the Nazi-Soviet pact happened, the government here once again came down very, very hard on communists. John Stachel, the son of uh, the other party leader, Jack Stachel, remembers from that time his father went underground. And he went underground as well. A lot of American communists did that. Uh, John had to change his name, grew up under a fake identity in upstate New York. Very different kind of life. He thinks it was the best thing that ever happened to him. On the other hand, my grandfather was put on trial for very old passport charges. And my grandmother was threatened with deportation back to the Soviet Union. And this was a campaign that went on off and on until her death in 1955 from cancer. Uh, 
and this was a way of the government putting pressure on my grandfather. What is very instructive about this time period, though, is that in the early days of the deportation proceedings, the Daily Worker, the communist newspaper, began a letter-writing campaign to get President Roosevelt to stop trying to deport her. And the letters poured in, not just from communists, not just from union members, but from dentists and Republican accountants and ministers, Baptist ministers, rabbis, people all over America saying, what you are doing now is un-American. This is not how we treat our people. And again, it's instructive to keep that in mind because it's easy to, to forget today how different our political climate is. So my grandfather was sentenced to prison to four years in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, of which he only served 14 months, because by that time, of course, the Nazis had invaded the Soviet Union, the United States entered the war, and everything changed. And my grandfather was once again in a leadership position. So that was some of the backstory, and those were some of the historical things that I found when I was in the archive, but even more powerful to me in many ways were the kinds of things I discovered about history and memory and the process of trying to unearth a very difficult past. This is a photograph of my father as a child holding a hammer and sickle, and I found it in the archive. I thought it was wonderful. I made a copy and I gave it to him as a Christmas present a couple of years ago, and he stared at it completely shocked because he had zero memory of that image ever being taken. So part of this process for me has been sharing aspects of my father's own past with him that he knew nothing about. Here's a letter that my grandfather wrote to my grandmother while he was in prison in Atlanta. And when I was reading this letter for the first time and many others like it, I thought, hush, they really didn't store this paper too well. Look at it, it's all splotchy. What could have happened to it? And I stared at it some more, and I realized that what I was looking at were actually tear stains from my grandmother's tears dropping onto the paper, because you would see them a lot at the very end of the letters. And it was clear that she had just been sitting there and weeping over those letters. I found other family photographs as well. My, my Uncle Bill shared with me a really wonderful photo album because when their father was in prison, their father's driver, Jack Childs, who had, again, spent a lot of time with the family and drove my grandfather, who didn't drive, everywhere, he took them down to visit their grandfather in Missouri. And this was the same grandfather who had written that poem at the prison gates, and, and there he was on his farm. And this is the kind of image that you so rarely see anymore, you know, a kind of touching image of, young children lighting their grandfather's cigarette, right? They, they don't do that anymore. And some great photographs of Bill with the chickens on the farm. But what I found out subsequently is that Jack Childs had, at this point, become an informer for the FBI. So that even as he was taking these wonderful family photographs, he was also reporting on the family. And not only that, but before he was an FBI informer, he had been an informer for the Soviet secret police. And his job was to report on everything that my grandfather was doing. I made an even more shocking discovery. I'd ordered up a lot of papers from the Soviet archives and I was in my grandmother's personnel file and I found a passport application for Nyanya and it was marked secret. And there were some things about the memo that accompanied it that I just didn't quite get. They made no sense to me. So I took this memo to my Russian teacher, and she explained, actually, Nyanya was working for the secret police from the very moment she started taking care of the babies. And she was sent over to the United States in order to keep tabs on the family for the Soviet authorities. And I still have the letter that she wrote to my grandmother asking if she could come over and be with the family in 1934. And that's why. So that really complicated my vision of the past. 
And then for my father's 80th birthday, one of his brothers who is, I'm trying to find a good euphemism for pack rat, but there really isn't one. He had recently unearthed something that my father had never seen before, his Soviet birth certificate. But on this birth certificate, even though my grandfather's name appears, his mother has a last name that no one had ever heard before, Luganovskaya. So there was my father finding out things about his own mother that he had never known. And as I did more research into her background, I found out things too that made her story just as compelling to me as my grandfather's story. Because not only had she grown up, been the first Jewish woman to attend law school in St. Petersburg, become a Bolshevik as a teenager, she had married the first editor of Pravda, who had gone from being a bread factory worker to being the editor of probably the newspaper in Russia and the Soviet Union that all of us have heard of. They got divorced, I think, before she met my grandfather. It's a little confusing. And he went on to become a Red Army general and then was executed on Stalin's orders in the late 1930s. So I keep thinking about my grandfather making all of those trips to the Soviet Union during the 1930s, knowing perhaps what could happen. While Raisa was a Bolshevik along with one of her sisters, the other two sisters and their parents were strongly anti-Bolshevik. And by the mid to late 1920s, their parents really wanted to leave the Soviet Union. So Raisa pulled every string she could to get them out of the Soviet Union and to where they really wanted to be, Berlin. And she corresponded with them, visited them for the last time in 1933 when she was moving to the United States, and kept up a correspondence in the last letter that I have from her father was from 1938, and he is desperate because he has not been able to get onto the visa list for Lithuanian Jews coming to this country. And she later found out that her parents were among the first Jews to be euthanized in nursing homes on Hitler's orders, you know, as he was gearing up for the Holocaust. So she had quite a difficult life that way as well. The story of the involvement, complicated as it is, between Russia and the United States and my family, however, does not end with that generation. This is an image of my first cousin, Bill Browder, my uncle Felix's son. And Bill, in 1996, moved over to the former Soviet Union and founded the largest private investment firm over there, Hermitage Foundation. I'm sorry, the Hermitage Fund, which was a $4.5 billion hedge fund. And he became an activist in this area and began to make a lot of noise about corruption in Russia. And in 2006, Putin, who he had been on good terms with before this, banned him from the country, and the government began harassing his employees, sometimes beating them severely, seizing their assets, and by 2008, Bill had sent his tax lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, which is a name that some of you may recognize, to investigate what was going on. By that point, Putin had seized $230 million of his assets. The Russians imprisoned Magnitsky, tortured him, and denied him medical care, and he died in prison 11 months later. It was an international scandal. And subsequently, Bill spent two years lobbying Congress until a year ago, he got them to pass what's called the Magnitsky Law, which establishes a human rights watch list for Russians entering this country. And in retaliation, the Russians banned Americans from adopting Russian orphans. A lot of you may have heard about that. That is because of my cousin and his situation. So I was all set to go to Russia this past summer to do research, and I called up the State Department because there was an item in the New York Times that Putin was trying to get Interpol to arrest my cousin Bill and extradite him to Russia, where he would be tried in absentia along with his dead lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, who would be tried posthumously on charges over there. 
So I talked to an official at the State Department who said, I really don't think it's a good idea for you to go, but you should talk to your cousin. And Bill told me at that point that the government had been coming down so hard on everyone that he was connected to that a former secretary of his, who he had had no contact with in 12 years, had been harassed so badly by the government that he had had to evacuate her and her small family to London. So clearly that was out of the question. So I'm having to do a lot of this research kind of through back channels. I've got a researcher in Russia uh, who's working for me in the archives and I'm doing what I can. But what's really striking to me, of course, with Edward Snowden in Russia, is how this story continues to reverberate today. You know, today, Edward Snowden is decried by many as a patriot and celebrated, or decried rather as a spy by some and celebrated as a patriot for others. And so, you know, to me, again, this speaks to the resonance of my grandfather's story as it continues to reverberate today. So thank you very much. I'd be very happy to answer any questions you have. Yes, sir. Make sure you speak in the microphone. Give me the microphone. Well, thank you very, thank you very much for uh, a wonderful talk. It's fascinating to hear about uh, your grandfather and everything else. Um, but I was wondering what kind of resonance you receive or find in uh, University of Richmond and other places with the current generation of college students uh, regarding these kinds of issues. It must seem like tremendously ancient history to them. Um, do you find an interest in the history of the Communist Party in America and the relationships with the Soviet Union and, and all of that? Or do you find that your main audience is people of my age? No, strangely enough, my freshmen are fascinated by it. To them, it's like a Hollywood thriller, and that's how they see it. So I've been really surprised to find 18-year-olds very interested in this story as well. Yes. Uh, were you able to find out how um, Jack Child uh, and or Nanya uh, were able to communicate back to the Soviet Union the information that they were supposed to be gathering? No, that's a great question, and I really hope I'll be able to find the answer to that. I assume that Jack Childs, who incidentally was also the first person to tip off the FBI to Martin Luther King's existence, starting their long harassment campaign of him. You know, Jack Childs was American, spoke English fluently, and I think would have had no problem meeting people and, you know, arranging for information to travel back to the Soviet Union. Yanya spoke no English, and I don't know, did she meet people at the Russian Orthodox Church where she worshiped? It's hard to know, and it's hard to know what kind of information she could share because she didn't understand English. You know, she could say who was at the house and who wasn't, but that would be about it. You know, my suspicion about her was that the 1930s was such a tough, tough time in the Soviet Union that she was really getting out when she could, how she could. And I don't know how much she ever passed on of value. Thank you so much for coming. It must be so interesting to have a personal story interweave in American history and to be able to make it part of your research. Um, your, your family's story just dovetails so well with the tension that I see in the history of the Communist Party in this country, which is essentially between, you know, this is a little simplistic, but between those who say communism in America was, was, a, was a genuine force of believers, of socialists and communists who thought that was the best way and, and um, you know, genuinely working for the, for the good of the United States. And then though the others who say the whole thing was infiltrated by the Soviets from early on, the shots were being called from Moscow and, and Leningrad, and so we can't look at the Communist Party in American history 
as kind of a grassroots or even genuine force. And so I wonder, you know, given that you did find the Soviet uh, fingerprints around your grandfather's work, what's your, your take on that kind of greater question and how we think about the Communist Party history in this country? Well, I think it's very complicated. I mean, I, I think that there really was an indigenous radical movement here. I also think all of those socialists were very, very inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution. And they thought of themselves as internationalists. I mean, even going back to my grandfather's stint in Leavenworth Prison, he was so thrilled to be there with the Mexican revolutionaries because he had been inspired by what they were doing in Mexico. So I think rather than thinking of the Americans as Soviet puppets, you have to think that they really believed in internationalism. And I also have to point out that during the war period, when my grandfather was sharing secrets with the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was our ally. There were portraits of Stalin up in American public elementary school classrooms. So again, I think it's very easy for us to forget these things. You know, which is not to say that terrible things didn't happen and that the American communists, my grandfather included, overlooked a lot of things or recontextualized them in ways that are painful for us to see today. I was just reading a speech he gave about the Moscow trials in which he compared the defendants in the Moscow trials to Benedict Arnold and said, well, you know, we look back at our revolutionary traditions and we know how important it is to get rid of these traitors who are trying to destroy what we're doing and that's what the Soviets are doing as well. You know, it makes me cringe to read it, but I think he really believed it. That was his framework. Yes. Yes. Um, can you, um, I'm, what I'm wondering is how did, what was the, uh, how did he put forth his belief that communism was Americanism? So what were, what were the basic uh, philosophy or ideas behind this concept that communism and Americanism were s identical or similar or shared, whatever? Well, he thought that what the American revolutionaries began was refined by Marx and Engels. So that he thought it was Jeffersonian thinking taken to a new level. That was essentially his point of view. And he wrote a great deal about it. I mean, folder after folder in that archive is full of drafts of speeches and articles he wrote in which he deeply researched American history. And you know, while some historians have assumed that it was kind of a cynical gambit of his to go in that direction, it's clear that he really believed in it very deeply and believed very deeply that communism was something that could be not just for you know, union members or socialists, but for people from all walks of life. I mean, it's amazing to see the kind of correspondence that went back and forth between him and Catholic youths who had written to the Daily Worker asking about communism. And he spent a great deal of time and effort in doing that kind of outreach. Yes. Um, your grandfather seems like a very outgoing and active man. Um, it was interesting for me to find out that someone had wrote a song about him called The Quiet Man from Kansas. So my question to you is, did people perceive him as a quiet man? You know, it's hard for me to answer. In my own life, I certainly perceived him as a quiet man. By the time I got to know him, he had basically said all that he was going to say. <laughs> He was extremely quiet by that point. You know, how introverted could he have been? He was on the road all the time. He was out in public all the time. But I wonder sometimes if all of that being out in public meant that he was introverted at heart and really kept quiet when he wasn't out on stage, you know, because I think there are a lot of public speakers who are like that. We have a question from Richmond. Oh. From by Nina. That's my daughter. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's not mommy, what are we having for dinner tomorrow night? <laughs> the question is, do you think that Earl Browder was both a spy and a patriot? Good question, Nina. <laughs> <laughs> I think 
Exactly. <laughs> I think Earl Browder would never have called himself a spy. I think that he thought what he was doing was internationalism. And you know, my cousin Risa, with whom I've talked over this issue a great deal, you know, says, we think of spying as a black and white issue, but it's not that black and white. You know, many people who we think of as spies don't think of themselves the same way. You know, maybe they start off by friendly meetings or sharing something that seems very innocuous to them. It's really hard to know. So I don't think he saw himself as doing anything bad, and he certainly never saw himself as unpatriotic. I think he thought that whatever he was doing, he was doing for the sake of promoting a more progressive world. We see it differently now. You, you mentioned at one point um, that Stalin basically cut him off or made him mm -hmm. an enemy. So, what was the? Because he's, you know, he was leading this popular movement and communism was acceptable here. Like, what what was Stalin's issues and what what happened there? That well, in a lot of ways, it was Stalin's way of firing the sh the first shot in the Cold War. You know, in 1943, during the Tehran Accord, you know, my grandfather was very inspired by Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt meeting. And he thought this was a harbinger of something new. And he wrote a book about it in which he proposed that after the war, you know, all of these different nations could come together in a very new way. Stalin had a really different idea. So at that point, you know, Stalin had the head of the French Communist Party, Jacques Duclos, wrote the, the Duclos letter, which attacked my grandfather as a revisionist. And the American communists came down hard on my grandfather to recant, and he refused to do so. And at that point, he thought, this can't be coming from the Soviet Union. This is just some crazy thing that's going on. I'm going to go to Moscow and talk to them. He went to Moscow and, of course, discovered that, no, this wasn't some crazy idea by the French or the Americans. And the Soviets said, just recant your position and everything's going to be fine. And he refused. He didn't want to do that. And at that moment, it was all over. He came back to this country. Reader's Digest offered him an enormous amount of money to recant his communist past and write one of those ex-communist memoirs that were to become so popular during the McCarthy era and he refused to do that as well. So he was really caught in between the anti-communists and the Stalinists. And it was a very uncomfortable place to be. You know, McCarthy had both him and my grandmother imprisoned at different points during the late 40s and 50s. So there, there was no happy ending to that story. Um, I think you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that your grandfather left school when he was nine? Yes. Right? And yet he wrote all these books. He sounds amazingly erudite, and he obviously spoke fluent Russian. No, he or didn't did he? speak a word of Russian. Oh, so he used interpreters. <laughs> and, and when he went to China, did he have interpreters? And how did he... He, he must have had interpreters. He was actually monolingual, which is really amazing. My grandmother spoke English and French and German, although after she found out about her parents' death, she refused to ever speak German again. But my grandfather really educated himself, and he wrote several unpublished memoirs, and it's just really heartbreaking to read how, when he was a young boy, you know, he might come across some old books in an office he was cleaning out, and he would take those books home, and he would study them and go over them thoroughly, and he loved learning more than anything. And he just never had a chance to go to school. So, so the library you mentioned that is at Syracuse is a library of books that he wrote or books that he collected to self-educate with? Both. And what was so haunting for me is when I first went to read through his personal library, I found so many of the books that I had in my own library, and it just felt like a, an incredible connection that I didn't know we had. Any other questions? <laughs>
Yes. Oh, you need your mic. Do you have any idea why so many people came to the defense of your grandmother from different walks of life? I think they saw her as a mother. You know, the Communist Party presented her as an apolitical housewife, the wife and mother of American citizens who was being persecuted by the government at a time when, in fact, um, immigration rules were easing up for people who had entered the country illegally. Of course, the party was a little disingenuous. She was far from apolitical. She was a very committed Bolshevik. And I don't think she was really married to my grandfather. He already had a first wife who he had left behind years before. And her name on the birth certificate is not Browder. So, you know, there were a few little issues there. But by and large, the public responded to this story. They saw her as someone who was being unfairly victimized as part of the government's persecution of my grandfather. And they, they thought it was un-American, and they were outraged. <clears throat> Uh, do you think, <clears throat> to, to, the, to the extent that international communism was fighting global capitalism, uh, that would explain uh, the subversiveness of American communists, because they are obviously against a government that is supportive of capitalism. And so that would cast them as spies in the eyes of the government. But, they're, but they're, in, in fact, they were fighting for the rights and, 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 uh, of American citizens, some of which were, as you said, were uh, uh, stated in the Declaration of Independence and the American Constitution, so on and so forth. So it's a very interesting situation they were in. They were fighting for American workers and American citizens, but against a government that is supportive of global capitalism. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it's a tough position to yes. be in. It really is. And, you know, again, they were, they were so inspired by what was going on in the Soviet Union they didn't know a lot about what was going on in the Soviet Union, but what they saw, they found very inspiring. So, you know, they were walking a very fine line. And hence the intriguing analogy with Snowden, right? With, uh, mm -hmm. because Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think these debates are going to erupt more and more over, over the coming years as we find out more and more about what the NSA has been up to. And as you know, perhaps more people like Edward Snowden emerge. Yeah. Well, I gave my right to the last question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>